Now, this is just a short one. This is on our OE business <coughs> learning program. Uh, it's older, 2009, 2010. Like anything else, another bad thing that happens with BL is the fact that you stay below the cut line because everybody else keeps raising their priorities up. And DL is expensive. When it came for us doing this particular program, it was $250,000. That was $2009, $2010. And so one of the things that as an initiative that we, Trade RG2, is doing is how to take this and put it on our OE uh, environment, operational environment, well for Why? Because we can change. We have the technology now that we can probably bring this back in and make it more effective for learning. And I'm going to show you part of that on that web portal before you guys get out uh, today. This is how you can get to it. And oh, by the way, all of these slides and all of this material is on the SharePoint site. So you can download it, you can use it. I just ask you that things that have uh, proprietary information or copyright information, please carry that copyright over. Okay? Please carry it over in your particular products. Uh, that helps you out because you don't want to have somebody sue you for um, intellectual proprietary knowledge. Right. OE integration and trends, these are some of the trends that we saw over the past few years. Uh, when we first started out back in 2002 with the quality assurance program, which was really good because we were finding out some things that were broken, mainly training and development that was broken within trade-off. When you go into a class and you see or you're doing a pre-accreditation assessment, and you see something with lesson plans and stuff that was dated 1989 at the time that you were looking at is 2004 or something wrong. <clears throat> Not current or wrong. And that's what we started finding that was out there and it got done. The other thing is, is because we were doing what? Just coming out of 9 11, we were just going into OIF, OEM. Even though the way we were talking about operational environment had started back in 1998, it was not catching in the system right away. However, from 2009 out, because we talked before, it was implement. That was the trade off commander, General Burns. Whole thing is implement on the stage, we'll let everything else catch up. Uh, and, but we said it's no longer implementation, it's now a dynamic integration of OE. Because we've been through it, we've gotten a refresher, we're good to go. That's one of the reasons I'm out here. That's why. To get you basically what basic knowledge you have is to enhance that. Answer questions, get you back up to snuff, and let you go. All right. And oh, by the way, I found out they said they're gonna bring me back about every two years. And they said the reason why is to help the staff about the development, to keep it continuous, because things change in the operational environment, things that you should know. All right. These are some of the OE innovations. One of them started from SSI because of the fact that Sergeant Major, the, uh, then in 2004-2005 at the NCO Academy here. He turned around and said, I can't wait for you SAS to try to give me products on OE. I need to have it in my course. So they found a unique way of doing the OE variable of the day. And what they can do is assign students a variable and allow them to come in, do the research on it, and make a short presentation the next day along with the Army back and talk about it. It helped. It was an innovative way. Aviation logistics, folks that were doing technical and tactical training, special war tasks and battle drills. They were the ones that figured out how to integrate tactical, technical, and safety lessons learned in their training. They set out in their coursework some things they had to reset or reorganize how the, the modules were set up to make it more effective. But it forced them to do it. Again, operational environment forced them to do what? Make the change. So you can do that. You can have it, but it's where appropriate. Are you going to do it the first time around? I'm going to tell you no. There are some things that we found out it takes sometimes two or three years to get it right in OE, especially when it came to the horses. Because they deal with a lot of com uh, mathematical computations and everything else, they finally found out how to do it, making practical exercises. They set OE as a backdrop for what they were doing, and that's some of the stuff I've been talking to you about today. However, on the board model, Bob, John Boyd was a fighter pilot in the 1950s and 60s who develop a process of how he could gain an edge over an enemy power. This is called the UDA process. It's been universally accepted through both the private sector and the public sector. Even in education, sometimes people use the UDA process. If you look at it, 
observation, orient, decide, and act. They used it at the Fire Center of Excellence on their lessons learned integration. They'll make an observation, then they would go and look at how that could be integrated into the respective training, that particular observation inside the lesson. Then they would do the decide. They would act on it, and the act also meant that they went through the process of evaluating the effectiveness of it. The act wasn't just do it in the platform they got on top of it. They said, no, what was the effectiveness of it? And it went through the process. As you notice, that we applied it with looking at the OE estimate. You look at that and you start saying, what is applicable when you look at training? Education. Where does OE go into it? Also, there is a little book that we have out called TC7-102, OE and Army Learning. You saw before that the Signal School had an actual book that they wrote on that time about OE. How could they integrate their training? It was an early start. In fact, the young individual that did it, he called it OE for Dummies. And we laughed about it and we made a good joke. And, but we took it and formalized it because it was the baseline approach. How do we deal with that in training and education? How do we integrate that in? What does it mean, where appropriate? I can tell you where appropriate, but you're going to figure that out because you know what you have to do. And this is basically what old Army Learning Model was doing. The OE context is set, is, is set, so you organize the learning for who? The learner. That's why it says learner-centric. It is not built for the instructor. I'm not the one being tested. I'm not the one being graded. Yes, I use the phrase, to teach is to learn twice, but it's also there is to learn what? How to deliver, how to facilitate. Here's some of it in the learner Center redesign, some things that just kind of gives you an idea. If you notice in the beginning, it says what? A collaborative approach. Also, resequence learning activities. Sometimes we have to do that to get effective learning. So when we're going through evaluating the, the assessing a course or a lesson, we're doing what? We may have to resequence it because it's out of sequence. Cultural awareness, one of the things that happened in the culture classes, we saw folks that were teaching some things out of sequence. And it wasn't effective. It took the culture center to come in and say, you have to follow this sequence. If you don't, it will not be effective. Because when they gave the implementation on it, they left it freehand thinking, thinking now that everybody was going to follow it. And they don't necessarily do it because they're doing what I'm trying to match when this bit fits in my core. It meant they had to teach those models. And it entered into a dialogue that said, can you short some things up? Because it's taking a, a course where I can't, I can't take anything else. Okay. Also, technically proficient. At the end of the day, I want a good AG individual. I want a good financial management individual. Technically qualified. High speed, low drag. But you notice the bottom says a problem solver, independent, lifelong learner. The lifelong learning occurs not only while you're on active duty, it occurs when you leave active duty. Having a hunger and a desire. One of the quotes that I have from a, a famous author, he says, forever drink from a Pyrrhian spring. Always drink from the well of knowledge and wisdom. Student ownership. I gave you that problem, you guys owned it. You did well, you did yourself well yourself, okay? Because you did well on it. Some of you were sharing your experiences and starting to go along when we were talking about the, the fact of a meal. I didn't give you the full length. In fact, one of the classes I was doing this on, it got tested. Because people were, I mean, they were, you had some jokes going back and forth and says, well, what happens? I'll give you a quick, quick answer to it. One of the things one of the guys says, yeah, but i got to move. Well, how many buses do I have? Well, this is when, how many buses I have. This is the traffic that's going on. He said, I've been in Korea. This is what's going to happen in the problem in the night. i got to get stuff from Dianne Tegu up 
and oh, by the way, I got a block because I got to make sure nobody has a traffic jam. This is when I got to get to this specific point because this is where I got to get the ammo from. They were going through war gaming and talking through it. I let them go through it. Only thing I had to do was just kind of prod them along every now and then to keep them on content. Because what was happening, the dynamics was occurring in the classroom between the students that I'm dealing with, staff and faculty, that they were carrying the conversation. In fact, one of them turned around and said, this is what I'm supposed to be talking about right now. In other words, he found an interest point into his lessons that he's supposed to teach. He'd been struggling for it. So that collaborative process occurred. And added, I break everybody's heart as a true prophet, true or traditional person. Addy remains there. No matter what you do, it is the skeleton that you put the meat on in developing learning products. I know they have sat, they have all these other things, but if you really look at it in its context, it's a combination of steps. One of the things we had in earlier editions of 350-70 in its rewrite was a piece called Spiral Design. And that was based on the fact that we had learned some hard lessons on how to rapidly develop lesson plans to get folks out. Some folks stay with the added process because it's sequential. One of the things that I'm an advocate of is the fact that sometimes an experienced, and I always say experienced training developer, very seasoned, can combine steps. And I'll give you an example. Do I need to do a needs analysis and conduct it? The commandant tells me this is what I want to do. Maybe, but no, not necessarily. Not necessarily, but what we would have is folks that say, you've got to do the analysis. What are you doing? You just directed me to train it, and this is the reason why. When we looked at IED that was going along, it wasn't a needs analysis on that. It was when the people was getting blown up. Get blown up, so they said, make it happen. It switched from doing an analysis of what we need to teach and where we need to do it to more in the development phase. In other words, you would get design and development phase. And in fact, in some cases, we were combining those things in the process so we can rapidly get the product out. So some of these things happen. This is another one talking about the added process, which we have out the TC 7 102, but we're also pulling up to just give you some folks some ideas. Ideas. I'm not saying that is the way ideas that you should be integrated and believe. This one I keep from my days being when I was working on my master's in human resource development with both. Uh, personnel management and training. Uh, when we're doing this, I always carry this chart because whether it's digital or analog, these are some of the things that work best. These are examples, and examples only. That's not a hard match rule. Uh, there are things that you can do, and I'll give you an example. General Dempsey never said, do away with PowerPoint. You may find some old times around saying, oh, General Dempsey said, do away with PowerPoint. He never did. He said, reduce the amount of PowerPoint. Let me give you an example of why. During one pre rotation assessment, I had a class that I was going to be looking at that had over 428 slides. I'm going to say it very slowly. 428 slides. I'm going to give them a little, a little bit of an out. It was a two hour class. Divide two into 428. <laughs> That's why I like that talk. Yeah. Okay. So what happens is, you're looking at it in a what 50 minute delivery. What the developer and the person failed to do was take advantage of animation because they had broken some things down into one slide. So then I'm trying to play keystroke. That's right. So what happens is, if you look at PowerPoint, you look at animation. What does animation do? It stimulates the brain through the eyes because you're looking at what scanning and picking out the points very real, very quick. You can make charts that are what, too busy to convey a message, or you can put them in sequence. Some of my charts and slides up there can be made, what, overlaid because it gets too busy. If you notice when I did the one on the variables and the office desk, it was animation. Why? Because it stimulates. It keeps the learning going. So these are some things you look at to do, go from abstract to concrete experience, videos. I particularly love dramatizations because you get folks in the class and they start doing the role playing and you start getting facial expressions. You get to see the things right there that happens before. That's just being the personal side in some places. Okay, definitely works better. 
So here's some summary and conclusions. You see here OE compliancy. How the degree that is brought in, that's something that you talk about to an evaluator. The one that I showed you from the Army Logistics, it's what they did. Tommy Geller said that he said, Well, this is what I'm doing, and this is why I'm doing it. He walked me through the process. I had seen it beforehand, but he confirmed to me what he was doing, why he was doing it. My question to him was, how is that working for you? It's working okay right now, boss, but I'll tell you what, we still got some work to do. I said, what? He said, in the, te in the technical and safety lessons learned, because what they were finding out was a lot of mechanics, that picked, aviation mechanics, that picked up some bad habits downrange. They were doing really speedy things that worked downrange. They could not bring it back to the continental United States or the western side of the house out of the air. Because they could go to jail or prison, more or less, because they violated the FAA. It worked good in the 80s, but you can't apply that out here. It's a safety consideration. All right? Also, you look here, you see that OE is the type in the one theater. That should be what you should take away from this. And don't wait till the last minute and then call and say, well, can you help me do this? No, I can't really help you do this. I can talk you through something, but it's going to tie prior your experience. So from this, you should be able to go back through your, your instructional materials and start taking a hard look at what am I doing. If you look at it, we got away from what we call hard coding lessons learned into lessons because a lot of times they were no longer perfect. Uh, important to the actual instruction. That's why you'll see insert the best observation, insight, and lesson. It empowers the instructor, gives you some latitude because it may be something you want to talk about today that you didn't need to talk about yesterday. Okay, now what I'm going to do, because uh, I mean, don't worry, y'all will get out here around the level. Y'all thought y'all would get out what time? See, I'm going to get y'all out of here a little bit early. Why? Because I like y'all. <laughs> See? What I'm going to do is make a quick transition. I'm going to take you through the Operational Environment Enterprise website. Any of you heard about that? Okay. I want to take you there because that's where you pull some of the videos off. That's where you, we're starting to put, we be a trade out G2, I'm starting to put a lot of our materials. Why? Because our director says so, the G2 but also because we're trying to create a one-stop shop. General Wallace used to use an expression when we do it with BCK as a battle command knowledge system or knowledge network. He says, if I can't get there in three clicks or less, I don't need it. So that's what we want to make sure that we do as I walk you through that. That's where you'll see some of the videos and things that are coming up now. Uh, in the meantime, what I want to do is Talk about also the decisive action training environment. How I many of you have heard of that? Ah, yeah. so date. date. Okay, so I'm going to talk to you a little bit about date. I'm going to show you a quick video on that, and then I'm going to take you to the OE portal. So I'll tell you what, why don't y'all take five, stretch, all right, do a seven minute stretch on you. Operations characterized by complex and urban terrain, the lack of front lines and insecure flanks. With rapid transitions between various aspects of unified land operations. While the U.S. focused on combat operations, potential adversaries were making different investments. These diverse adversaries, some of whom believe they are already at war with the U.S., employ traditional, irregular, and hybrid strategies to threaten U.S. interests. General Milley, in his confirmation hearings, summarizes his concerns. What do you consider the greatest threat the United States of America faces? Well, I would put Russia right now from a military perspective as the number one threat. I would also add uh, China, North Korea, uh, and ISIS uh, along with Iran. Threats emanate from nation states such as near peer competitors or regional hegemons and from non state actors including transnational terrorists, insurgents, and criminal organizations operating from ungoverned areas or failed states. Adversaries, including Russia and the Islamic State, operate beyond physical battlegrounds, subverting and shaping public perceptions via propaganda and social media. The potential for disruptive technologies is steadily growing. As military technologies proliferate, 
all adversaries will employ increasingly advanced weapons against U.S. forces. Some advanced threats are approaching parity and in some cases are superior to U.S. weapons. To negate our standoff advantages, enemy forces will fight in cities and operate from populated areas. Enemies will fight on familiar terrain, among civilians, and within known cultural environments. The enemy's capabilities will be optimized for their terrain and circumstances, including niche capabilities to exploit U.S. vulnerabilities. Enemies will combine complex fires and maneuver with irregular forces, criminals, and terrorists operating among civilians. They will exploit their environments to close with friendly forces where combat mobility is constrained and use camouflage, cover, and concealment to achieve tactical surprise. This enemy may be difficult to template as they strive to identify and exploit U.S. vulnerabilities, learning, adapting, innovating, and attempting to create opportunity. Threat patterns of operation will change as they achieve success or experience failure. In the conflict between Russia and Ukraine, we see extensive use of electronic warfare, cyber, and social media, mass artillery fires, advanced air defense systems, denial, deception, and ambiguity, unmanned aerial vehicles, and in-depth involvement of Russia's intelligence services in an area where the military may not control the battle space. This shows the re-emergence of a sophisticated, heavy hybrid threat the U.S. must prepare for. In the Middle East, threats are gaining military capabilities previously associated only with nation-states. Irregular forces are growing more capable as they adopt new weapons and tactics and achieve coordination previously only seen with conventional forces. Anti-tank guided missiles, or ATGMs, have emerged as one of the biggest killers on the battlefield. Advanced ATGMs are in the hands of Islamic State forces and Hezbollah. Hezbollah, in addition to advanced ATGMs and rocket-propelled grenades, has manned portable air defense systems, unmanned aerial vehicles, and a sophisticated mission command system. Hybrid adversaries, both state-based and non-state actors, can disrupt U.S. technological advantages through cyber attacks, GPS jamming, and other countermeasures. The Army's Decisive Action Training Environment, or DATE, rapidly takes experiences and lessons learned from recent and ongoing conflicts and incorporates changes in enemy objectives, capabilities, weapons, tactics, and techniques into the Army's virtual operating environment. Forces Command Commanding General Robert Abrams, addressing fundamentals in ForceCom, made this connection between our current operating environment and training for future Army leaders. We live in a complex world. We live in an uncertain world. So I submit, it's not what to think. What we need to put a premium on is how to think. And that's the beauty of the decisive action training environment. The actual mix doesn't matter. What matters is, is you're bringing in a different complex environment every time. Because then it puts a premium on leaders and units that can think on their feet. DATE provides a common training environment for use throughout the Army for home station training. DATE features a hybrid threat that reflects the complexities and potential adversaries we could face in the 21st century. This threat includes guerrilla, insurgent, criminal, and near-peer conventional forces woven into one dynamic environment. In contrast to current counterinsurgency-based mission readiness exercises, the DATE, including data from Ukraine, Syria, and Iraq, allows units to fully exercise their mission essential tasks supporting the Army's core competencies of wide area security and combined arms maneuver. The armies to produce units and leaders who know how to win in a complex world, our training scenarios must reflect today's operating environment. The decisive action training environment does just that. Our future adversaries are unknown and unknowable. Consequently, we must prepare to face a complex hybrid threat which features not only a near-peer conventional threat, but also guerrillas, insurgents, and criminal networks, which can act in concert, presenting a challenging problem set for our units and leaders. Brigade combat teams will have to simultaneously contend with this full range of threats against the backdrop of complex human terrain. They will be engaged on land, from the air, in cyberspace, and in the electromagnetic spectrum. Our combat training centers, informed by the date, replicate an unpredictable complexity of the world today. The opposing forces, or op for replicate the complex hybrid threat, leveraging a kaleidoscope of human terrain.
which is technically complemented by unmanned aerial systems, military information support operations, electronic warfare, and many other things. The data enables our CTCs to prepare our units and leaders to win in a complex world. By rapidly including lessons learned from ongoing, emerging, and future conflicts and threats into date-informed combat training center rotations and home station training, the U.S. Army is not looking back, but into the future. All right, switching gears. Getting too good with this just means that I'm gonna have to, that means I'm gonna end up being a station. Uh, that's all right, I'll be back home and get part of the country. One of the things that we're learning from Dave, uh, and the reason that we went to it, was primarily because of the fact that our we needed something that would be used by multinational partners uh, in education. And uh, Is, is that we noticed that, and again, I, you heard me talk earlier about the fact that we want to get you to where you have the basic skill sets and everything is applied, and it's doing what? Cutting down the learning curve before you deploy. Most of our adversaries says, don't allow the U.S. to build up the combat power. Make them commit early when they want to, because we can no longer stay with the long lead time. Going to the days we found out in the first Gulf War, when we started out basically in about August and then started doing combat action until really around January. Then the Russians that were advising Saddam Hussein had basically said, don't allow the time to build up. Do what you got to do and then pull back. Because otherwise you're going to contend, or either you go in and attack them. So you see that data is being used there. You'll see right here, this is the Chief of Staff and Army Director, and everybody would go to data. Whether you're in training, education, or leader development, it's used as a backdrop. Date itself is the framework of conditions. Now you might be saying, well, how does an AG person fit in? How does a, a financial management, and how does a logistician, how does a graves registration or mortuary specialist fit in? Because you take those conditions and you frame a problem set for them. Scenario development is what you're using. We try something back. In the earlier versions around 2012, 2013, when the captain's career force is what we call the multi branch staff effort. And it was to be able to allow every school to participate with their appropriate uh, advanced course. One of the learning things that walked out of it was the fact that for the AG at that time, you were running basically two captain's career courses a fiscal year. The rest of the Army, a lot of them, which you maneuver and everybody else, they were running four or five, sometimes up to six have more iterations. So the problem there became what? Timing, making sure you have folks that were either right there where they really could understand everything and participate in the process, or they would be failing. In other words, somebody had gone through the MDMP process and was way advanced over here, another person hasn't even started yet. So it became a point where some schools actually broke it down and they started coordinating, like the Fort Benning, Fort uh, Seal, I think Wachuca is still involved as well as Fort Leonard because they can kind of get their courses tied together and participate. An advantage when you do that is no longer do you have the combat arms person that's trying to play the one or the four. You have the actual professional there that understands what's going on and it kind of gets everybody exposed to what they're supposed to do. Gone are the days of CASQ, Combined Arms Services Staff School, that was prevalent in the 1980s till it went away in the early 2000s. Uh, because combined arms, or CAS Cube as we call it, was designed to get a lot of folks in the same room from various branches. Uh, and they learned to work together because mainly everybody wasn't getting selected to go to the command general staff college. But there were positions as majors and things that we needed to do that they needed that great degree of staff interaction. So from that, you can take the, the science of action training environment and use it as a backdrop. Understand what I'm saying because I speak for the acting and everything else uh, is that you can use it as a backdrop to frame 
what the conditions you want those folks to deal with. I just did it today right off the cuff. I didn't mention date, but I did it with what? With Korea. I took something that was very low key, put it out there, and allowed you to discuss, to drive to learn. That is a way you're doing it. But the reason we came up with date was because we needed something that puts everybody on the same sheet of music. You don't have to learn the same role that's being played by one particular threat or adversary in date by, a, and then you go somewhere else and it's totally different. Okay? So you see what is date. I'm just going to kind of briefly go through this because, again, you have the slides, and I think the video speaks for itself about what date is. But I'm going to bring you up to speed as to what is happening with date. Again, you have the complexities that's out there. One of the things is, is I've had folks, and I didn't cover it in the last portion, was folks asked, they said, well, can you cover equal opportunity using uh, DATE and OE? And I said, yes, it is, because it frames a condition that you take a real-world situation and put it in. They said, can you do it with SHARP? And I have the SHARP Academy for the artist two buildings away from me. They moved it to, to Fort Leavenworth about three years ago. And so one of their quality assurance persons came over and was sitting down talking to me and they said, how are we doing? I said, this is what you do to get data in as well as OE. It forms the backdrop of things that happen. Okay, one of the things I will share with you is sexual harassment. You actually had to do an OIF-1 that was a postal lieutenant who was sexually assaulted by an Iraqi national. So that happens in the 80s. A lot of times you can build that because we know what, from practical experience and around, we know what? Sexual harassment and assault doesn't happen just at the age. It starts at the installation and it continues all the way through the deployment and all the way back. As I share with everybody, I said it doesn't happen on my watch because it affects the readiness. I don't care whether it's male on male, male on female, I don't care. It affects my readiness. I have enough problems with it. Well, dealing with the old man and his personality versus doing my mission. So I want everybody doing a full tilt boogie, what? To perform, because I want to bring you home. That's the attitude that you have to make sure you bring about. So when you're introducing those problem sets, you can say, this is what's going on. And the reason why we take it out of the context of Iraq, because they've already been there, so they formally, this is what works. No, how do I ratchet the problem up? How do I make it more difficult? How do I take that and then combine that particular situation with, and you start throwing in some complexity, that they just got a letter from home. They're getting something off of social media. All of that ties, ties you up. You can spend the day on it, but you're the experts. You know how to craft it, okay? So you see exactly, in each country that you find that, Ariana, as I always point out, is not a right. This composite of, of uh, country and conditions. Uh, we changed that in that terrain in the South Caucasus. This is on the current date, with this date version 3.0. Okay, so again, it's a framework of conditions. It's not the scenario. You're taking this to design your own scenario, all right? And what we had to do there, we had to do some geographical revisions, uh, add some more irregular threat actors out there, as well as info war, because we're seeing a lot, as you saw in the video, folks are being, for info warfare, criminals. Folks that are dealing with information and they exist to steal as much of your information as possible. Uh, if you haven't realized, you'll see now there was a, art, a commercial on this morning talking about VPN, and the guys are talking about how they can use that to secure their particular uh, networks because everybody's getting hold to them. And you have folks that are what? Lone wolves who go out there and will steal your information. They will steal your information. If you go back to Bagram Air Force Base a few years ago, that's one of the reasons we lost thumb drives was because they found a whole bunch of them that was sitting out on the little local market. And it was not with classified information. It was with PII. So if I get your bank account numbers and knowing that most people do not change their passwords and everything else, and some of them are so simple as one, two, three, four, I'm serious. Talking to folks that crack the codes, and they said they can get in, and once they get it, they start making a linkage. Remember, I said I hate remembering passwords. It's so what we do as a as a human thing. We start using the same password over and over, so I don't have to remember. 
So if I get it, I've already broken the door to get in. One of the things that happen when we talk about military system is because of the fact that if I can gain entry to one individual, I can get in the system. I put malware in and it starts to open up. During the Ukrainian crisis, some of the things that we learned, there was a young Ukrainian artillery officer who, like anything else, good natured, wanted to develop an application that would bring up uh, faster times for delivering artillery because it would do the calculation. This individual went as far as vetting who he was sending to, knew that they had the right addresses and everything else. Somehow the Russians got hold to that information and got hold to that app, and they were able to slide malware into it such that when anybody opened that app, it gave the geolocation away. Now, the end of that story is they had some Ukrainian folks that happened to apply that app, and some of their survivors said what they saw was a UAV flying over. They thought they were detected by the UAV. They had been detected by electronic means. That's what they were talking about, electronic means. And they were able to locate them, send the UAV over for what we call a dynamic retasking, one, to verify that the target was there, and to also do a battle damage assessment. The units disappeared in five minutes from the artillery strike. Such that currently, General Milley also talked about the fact of our brigade headquarters and the fact that it takes too long for them to move. We were doing some things, and I can tell you, real world, from the Michigan Command Center of Excellence, it was taking 55 hours for a brigade talk to break down and to move and reestablish itself. 55 hours. As a former HHC commander, brigade level, forward deployed, if it took me longer than 20 minutes, my book was fired. In those days, the signal platoon had to come in and do some things on their cables to remove. I had to make a prioritization on which vans to move the whole nine yards. And it was three vans. ADCS, the old man, the colonel's van, and the ops van. Those were the primary things that had to move. Even my tent was one of those that was last. One of the things we found out, this is the reason I was talking about fiber off the cable and some of that in the beginning, was that a lot of our mission command boxes were built for what? Stationary, when we built to move. And that's why when you're talking about some things, when you're taking a tactical approach and an exercise where you take them in the field, you're trying to let folks know some of this will disappear. And also when I was talking about casual rates. We won't go into a great discussion on that. I don't want to give me a lunchtime, I don't need to get sick. Okay, so we talked about here some of the geographical representations that changed in the day 3.0. And then some of the new threat actors, and we'll still move along kind of because you can still see this. But what I want to get to is now the chief of staff of the Army has told us last year, told us to be a trade off G2. I want three regional dates and as well as the ones that we have existing now. So Date Africa is one that's being used. And we're in development right now. We have a team back in my office, uh, back at Fort Leavenworth, that's working the date, date Africa. So it will be for the African campaign. If you ever understand anything about Africa, especially Africa, Africa, as folks say, will never exist as a headquarters in Africa. It sits in Italy and in Europe. One is because you don't want to basically pee anybody off. Everybody's your friend. You don't want to make anything because you can move them. They have folks that's there as to do command and control, but then you won't see the headquarters there. So the commander of, head of Africa sits where? In Europe. Also, we have Bay Pacific, basically in the region. It's not sitting directly on North on Korea. But it has that type of influence. Again, composite base, and then you'll see exactly what we're trying to get at there. If you understand anything right now in the world, the Chinese are a big player in the Pacific. A few years ago, when President Obama uh, turned around, he said, We're pivoting to the Pacific. A lot of people lost their minds. They said, Well, you know, we still need to be in Europe. He said, You don't understand. The Chinese are trying to make sure for commercial sh shipping, excuse me, in the Moluccan Straits 
because that's where a lot of our commercial shipping goes through, that they actually reign supreme in there. That's the reason why you see the naval presence, the air presence. If you look at it, China also has, on the western coast of Africa, they have some bases that are in that particular area. Why? Because they're maintaining their presence. Again, commercial shipping. So the Indian Ocean and the Pacific Ocean is open. Now to us in the Army, we say, well, you know, we're not out there as a Navy, but it means that certain key components or islands in there may be able to be held. If you ever heard of a place that I call Diego Garcia, I would tell you to investigate that. I learned it from some folks that was actually stationed there. It's a base there, U.S. base. Actually, we land B-52, B-1s, and even, no, not B-2s, B-2s are flying home. But B-1s as well as B-52s, which were actually flying in that little island in the middle of that Indian Ocean. Let's just put it this way. If you're going there, it's just like Kwajalein Island, if you ever figure that out, too. It's a nice place. Okay? Make sure that I can go there. And we also have Date Europe. This is a team that I'm leading. Right now, we're taking Europe. And you heard me talk before about Germany and all the basically our NATO partners were taking an existing joint war fighting center, which is a NATO entity, uh, and taking that the basics that they have there and leveraging as much as possible to produce something that folks can use. The command of General Staff College, uh, General Lundy, told them they will use date, a date-based exercise. They chose date Europe. And right now we are moving ahead very, very carefully but also rapidly uh, making sure that gets into their course or they have to be ready to go in August. In fact, there's still folks who are collaborating with them right now, side by side, on the materials to make sure they can get it set to the course <coughs> office. So when they leave their um, uh, course, elective courses, they're able to, those authors are able to put it together. So you can see now that we'll have data while it's out there. They believe it. Our multinational partners love it. Like I said, I have a British liaison. We have a contingent that's in Australia right now doing a hybrid threats uh, OE mobile training team. You guys got to go to uh, Australia. They were picking the meters and yeah, you just get to go to Fort Jackson. I said, that's okay. Not a lone pro. Plane ride, and also I ain't getting no frequent flyers off for that one. <laughs> okay. But, uh, but you do. But, but the thing is, is that's what's happening across the board. So, what am I telling you in the long run here? I'm going to get ready to close up here a little bit. Uh, OE is important to you. Uh, we had some good comments on the break about the fact that it should be in uh, the instructor facilitated course. Okay, we've had it there. It's the intention going back and forth. One of the other things is, is that, they, that folks that are developing that, that, a lot of times they'll pull it out because they think, well, I'm saving more time by pulling this out and I'll put something else in. And we say, you don't understand. You haven't given instructions to the respective schools and centers to add this in or director to do this on their own. Because you're tailoring what I'm giving you to your respective coursework. I'm giving you the broad brunt, broad basis of it. It's like being on a buffet line, and you're going to pick and choose whether you want steak, you want tilapia, whether you want pork chop. I don't care. But you're tailoring to what? Your needs. Then we come back and we see, how is that working for you? You have the requisite experience because you do this every day. You just need to know what? What are the ingredients in the cabinet, in the cupboard, that you bake the cake in? I'm not going to tell you how you sequence of it. Because what? You're the best cooks. You're the best ones with it. And one of the other things, I'm just going to show you the actual screen. I'm not going to spend a lot of time with it, but just let you know where to go to pick up a lot of the resources and what we do. And it's to the G27, and you'll see exactly the euro for it. Well, it helps a lot if you change it. You see it over here, you get a bad instructor again. We'll have to talk about you. That's because also I have a classroom 21 that's in my building right down from my office. And I have to relearn menus when I go out, OK? That's an excuse. That's my story, and I'm sticking to it, right? OK. Right, so Francis, can I, can I stick to it that way? See, she's good to go. She's good to go. She's got it. All right? But what it does is it allows you to go there, and you can go in and pick up the videos that we have. 
A lot of times I can show some of you if you wanted to when I get rid of release you. Or you can go in and you can pull off a lot of historical narratives. That's what we have our virtual Op4 Academy. So when you heard me talk about taking the COE distance learning course, that's one of the things that we're looking at doing is exploring where we move that based on some of the material I had and then moving it over so you can actually do the OE training so it's delivered. The key piece is to train your staff and faculty. So some other high points. Leave a good continuity book when you leave it. Tell why you changed a lesson or you in, injected something somewhere. Another one is, is to make sure that when you're doing the court, you're in your developmental process, not only those notes, when you do a critical task of uh, selection, site selection board, make sure you keep the minutes from it. That helps on the presentation. When I go through and I look and I say, did they consider OE in this task? A lot of times it's point blank, no. What drove this task for your change? You can involve the folks from Trade Out G2 to be able to do that. Yes, sir. Sorry to interrupt, sir. I need to see it, Captain Cyber. Oh, okay. Go right ahead. Okay. I like that. That's definitely like a good coordination. Oh, no, I'm not, sir. Not <laughs> coordination. Okay. That's all right. Thanks a lot. Uh, but anyway, what you want to make sure that you do is you can contact me or my counterparts out of Trade Out G2 to help you and help guide you in developing your individual training programs you want to be staff out. We're partners. I don't know all the particulars. I'm going to guess at some of them. Some of them I'm going to read. But you can design it just like I had with the folks from the Sharp Academy and I started guiding them through because that helps get to the one. It's not so much of the quality assurance passing that. It's making sure they got effective learning and lifelong learning. So I appreciate your attention and time. You guys have been very energetic. And Valentine's Day, go eat all that candy, get it all up, okay? We will have a weigh in tomorrow morning after the night. <laughs> Okay, but y'all have a great day and I'm very proud of you. Keep going.